A lot of you in here today obviously are going through an emotional roller coaster, which we all understand. Um, but as lawyers, we're going to be quite dispassionate and talk about what you can do to put yourselves in the best possible position. So we're going to try and take the emotion out of the equation, but I do understand that there is obviously a lot of emotion about how you're feeling. Um, I was very touched by Eleanor and Veronique um, talking about being in limbo. You may look at us this evening and judge that we're three very dull, white lawyers, but 30 years ago, a little leaflet came through my parents' door. I was living in Norfolk at the time. I was 18 years old. And it said, AIDS, don't die of ignorance. And my mum looked at it and went, well, we won't be needing that. And she put it on the fire. Little did she know that I was scared. Because I was a second class citizen in this country. The age of consent for gay men was 21. I was 18. If I kissed my boyfriend, I could be prosecuted. If I had sex with my boyfriend, I could go to prison. So I know what it's like to be the other, to be constantly worried and scared, to have the press constantly, every single day, demonizing you. And we were at a conference six months ago in Germany where the German lawyers were astounded about how we could have voted for Brexit. And we showed them the papers that Eleanor had put up on the presentation and their jaws dropped and said, in Germany, that would be a race crime, a race hate crime. And it is not surprising that Brexit has happened because of the daily vitriol that has come out from the Daily Mail, the Sun, and the Daily Express. Yeah. And what we are talking about are human beings. And I would like to give you some experience about what we did as a gay community in the 90s, is we said, enough. And we rose up and said, politicians, you need to do something. And it was a very brave politician called Sir Norman Fowler, who stood up to the extreme right in Margaret Thatcher's cabinet and said, enough. And he turned it into a health issue. And on an issue to do with you know, fags and queers and gays, it was a human rights issue. And it's about time our politicians had some backbone. It is not about the will of the people, because if you believe that democracy is about the will of the people, where does it end? What if the British people voted to stop non-white immigration? Would our parliament go down and say, well, that's what the public voted? If you have the view it's the will of the people, it is the tyranny of the majority. So it's about time our politicians stood up and had, to coin a phrase, some balls. So anyway, I will now hand you over to Kim, who's going to talk about the legalistic aspects of Brexit. Some of what you may hear tonight you may not agree with, because as certain speakers said this evening, you don't want to apply for settled status. We have views on whether Brexit is the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do, but it is going to happen. And we will talk through what other communities in this country have had to face with the hostile environment, and you do not want to be in that place. So you need to protect yourself, no matter how painful that is, so that you have a voice. And it's about you speaking as a three million people about deciding your future. So over to Kim. Thanks, Andrew. So I really am going to lower the emotional temperature right now, just for a moment. <laughs> then you get Andrew back again. But just in the meantime, on the plus side, I mean, there is a provisional agreement about the rights of EU citizens to stay in the UK. And it is not final because nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. And as Olivia was saying, there is a lot to be agreed, like Northern Ireland, before we get a final agreement. But there is an agreement in principle about what will happen um, to EU citizens living in the UK. And that, that agreement was reached in December last year. So what's been agreed? Well, EU citizens living in the UK before Brexit date, so 29th of March next year, will be allowed to stay. But they, you, will need to apply for a new status. Now, the British government has said that it will introduce 
the new system later this year. In late 2018, there'll be a new system. It will be a voluntary system at first, so people, and they'll be introducing it in stages. It will be voluntary to start with. Now, the final deadline will be at least two years after Brexit date. Now, so it will be at least March 2021 will be the final deadline for applying for this new status. It may well be a lot longer than that, actually. I mean, the EU has, has been arguing in, in the with draft withdrawal agreement that it should be even two years after that. Um, and obviously today, I don't know if you've heard, I mean, I've been in here, but with, there has been a provisional agreement on the transition period. So it was going to be that there'd be different rules for people arriving in the transition period. So, so that's after Brexit date, but before the end of 2020. But now it turns out that they will have the same rights. So all those people will also be applying for the same status, and they're going to have to have time to do that. So we don't quite know when the final deadline will be, but it's not going to be immediately. So you don't have to do anything right now. So what about this new status? What about this new system that's going to be introduced? The government says it will be simple and straightforward. And it has to be simple and straightforward. Well, there is, I'll tell you about the good parts first, and then the catches. So the good part is that the government is going to try and automate the thing, to, because of course they can't, there's vast numbers. The current system couldn't possibly cope with three million applications. So they're going to try and automate the thing. Now, what they're going to try to do, what they've said, this hasn't been published yet, but what they've said face to face, is there will be an app. So it's going to be entirely online. It will be on your phone or on your computer. And there will be three checks to get through. So the first one is nationality. Are you an EU citizen? And so you'll have your app on your phone and you will upload a photo of your passport or identity card. Then we'll ask you, how long have you lived in the UK? And finally, do you have a criminal record? Now, supposedly, those are the three questions. And then the answers that you give will be checked against other government departments, so HMRC, your tax records and police records. And then, supposedly, if it all checks out, and according to your tax records, for instance, they, it says, oh, yes, this person's been here for at least five years, you will get settled status. So settled status is the new equivalent of permanent residence, which is a status which already exists under EU law. And if it turns out that you've been here for less than two years, so less than five years, you will get a temporary status, so a temporary status, so which, or a, or a pre-settled status. And the idea is once you've clocked up your five years, then you'll be able to convert that into a settled status. Now, the catch is, so, a lot of so for some people, the idea is that most people will sail through this. because you know, They've been working here for five years. They don't have a criminal record. It's very straightforward. So two weeks later, they get a message saying, yep, yeah, you've got your settled status. The problem is, of course, when you make things very simple, some people's lives are not so simple. So some people are here, and they haven't been working for five years for all sorts of reasons. So then, presumably, this system will say, ah, oh, yes, well, in your case, we need some more information but we just don't know how that's going to work. You know, what information will they want? What tests are they going to apply? We just don't know that yet. Um, the government said it will cost less than a British passport, which right now is £72.50. Um, it's about to go up, but that's what it is at the moment. If you already have a permanent residence document, so that's a document issued now under EU law, then it will be free to swap it for this new settled status. Now, one really important point here is that the immigration minister, the current minister and the previous minister, the immigration minister has said that they're not going to care what you've been doing over this five-year period, or if it's less than five years. All you have to do is show you've been living here. That's what they're saying. So we haven't had any of the precise details, but the, so the immigration minister said we're not going to apply any tests about whether they've been working and exercising their treaty rights. So treaty rights are meaning exercising a right under EU law. It literally is just if they can demonstrate residency. So that's what the government's saying. Now, we haven't seen exactly how this works, but that's what they're saying. And I'll explain why that's important. So look, we do have questions about this thing. So it sounds, if it's as simple as that, 
Well, that sounds good, but look, we still don't know exactly how this will work. So we've been told about this. The government has told people face to face. The Home Office said, this is what we're planning to do. Various different people have met them. This is a plan. But they haven't actually published details of this new system. So we don't know how it will work. And we don't know how it will work for people whose lives are a bit, you know, not quite as straightforward and haven't got their, their tax records all, all straight because they haven't been working or whatever. One of the particular issues, what about people living outside the UK? Now, the government says you will be able to apply outside the UK. But one particular thing is that, so under, at the moment, under EU law, once, if you've been living here for five years, depending on what you've been doing, but you, you may acquire, acquire permanent residence automatically under EU law. So some people have been living here, working here, maybe they clocked up their five years a couple of years ago, but they're outside the UK at the moment. They pop back every now and then, but they've, they've got their permanent residence. Can those people apply for settled status? We just don't know. We don't have answers to that. Part of the reason is we haven't had any input into this. The government is very keen to keep lawyers away from the development of this process. So we, we can't ask them these difficult questions. So um, it, you know, maybe they're going to present us with something they've already decided. Another point is that permanent residence, the EU status, the EU law status, is automatic. You get it automatically after five years. Now, this settled status, as we mentioned in the last panel, is something you have to apply for. So can you get that backdated and say, well, look, I've, you know, I've been here for 30 years. You know, I acquired permanent residence many years ago, 10 years ago, whatever it was. Can you get the settled status backdated? We just don't know about that. One really important thing is that the withdrawal agreement, the draft withdrawal agreement that the, the EU has written, now, it only covers EU citizens living in the UK in accordance with EU law. Now, that matters because... Under EU law, you acquire permanent residence. You have a right of residence, you acquire permanent residence, only if you fit into certain categories. So you need to be working or self-employed, self-sufficient or a student. Now, if you're not working, under EU law, you have to have this comprehensive sickness insurance, which the UK, effect, in practice, the UK government interprets as meaning you have to have private health insurance. So that's extremely controversial. A lot of people disagree with the UK's interpretation, but that's what they're insisting on. So, now the UK has said, for this settled status, we're not going to worry about comprehensive sickness insurance. We're not, never mind that issue, we don't care what you've been doing, you're just going to have to show you're living here. So if you haven't been working, don't worry about the comprehensive sickness insurance. But that is not going to be nailed down in the withdrawal agreement that the EU is sticking to EU law. The British government said, it's fine, it'll be okay. But that's a unilateral assurance from the British government. And, you know, so... Maybe in a year or two they might say, you know what, that thing we said about comprehensive sickness insurance, we're, we're not so sure now. So we just don't know. So it's very unsettling. And of course, what happens if there is no agreement? You know, nothing is agreed, nothing is agreed. What if, there, what if we do crash out and there is no withdrawal agreement? Then all of this stuff is off the table. Now, the Home Office say, when you talk to them in person, they say, look, we're going to do this anyway. We've got to have an agreement at some point. So we are going to be granting settled status to people who apply. But they haven't guaranteed that in writing. They haven't promised that in writing. They're just saying that. So, you know, are they going to do this? I don't know. How much do you trust the British government on this? So there's a... <laughs> right. So there are a lot of questions still to be answered. Um, if it does, in case we do crash out and there's no agreement, it would be good to have some kind of evidence of your status here, the fact that you've been living here lawfully or living here at all. So what can you do if you want to get some kind of document about your status here? So the current system we have under EU law, as part of the EU, what happens is that after five years in the UK, living in the UK, you acquire permanent residence. And as I mentioned, that's, that's something you, you acquire automatically. You don't have to apply for any documents. Getting a document doesn't give you any extra rights. All it is is the government saying, yes, we agree you have those rights, which you've already got. Now, it's become a lot more straightforward. There's this famous 85-page form, this paper form, which is still there. They keep talking about revising. It's still there. Most people can apply online now. There are a few categories of people who can't, but most people can apply online. The online application is pretty straightforward. So you have to show that you've, you've done your five years. You apply online. 
You can use the European Passport Return Service if you don't want to send your identity card or your passport off to the Home Office. So you apply online, then you go to a council, a local council, take your stuff there. They will copy your passport and then hand your passport back and then send everything off to the Home Office. And it's pretty quick at the moment. I mean, for most cases, they're coming in under a month at the moment. You know, we had one that just came back in a week and a half. So if it's complicated, it will take longer. Can't take more than six months, but it's pretty quick. But the huge catch here is this thing that if you're not working, you have to show comprehensive sickness insurance. And the British government interprets that as meaning effectively, you almost always have to have private health insurance, which is a real problem for lots of people. Even though you're entitled to use the National Health Service, that's pretty comprehensive. But the British government says, no, that doesn't count. You can get it backdated effectively. So when you get your document, you get a letter with it. And if you show that you did your five years, that you completed your five years in 2016, the letter will say, we deem you to have acquired permanent residence on 1st of February 2016, or whatever it is. And that can be important, because if you want to apply for British citizenship, then you have to show that you've had, in most cases, you have to show that you've had permanent residence for at least a year. So effectively, you can get it backdated. And as I mentioned, one of the problems with this settled status is, you know, we don't know if you can get that one backdated. It costs £65. I know it's really annoying that it costs anything at all. It does cost £65, but by Home Office standards, that is an absolute bargain. Believe me, it really is. As Andrew will be explaining, if you deal with non-EU citizens, the fees are astronomical. I mean, many, many thousands. Up well, north of 10,000 often. It, they're hugely expensive. And if you have this, so if you have a permanent residence document, you will be able to convert it into settled status for free. So look, what do you do? Look, if you don't qualify for a permanent residence document, so for instance, you've got this issue, you haven't been working, but you don't have the comprehensive sickness insurance, you're going to have to wait for the new settled status. You know, wait and see what happens. But in the meantime, do keep evidence of your residence here. Do collect documents. At least have something. You know, if you've got your gas bills, keep them. If you can find old council tax bills, just keep some kind of evidence of your residence here. If you do qualify for a permanent residence document, then I would suggest that you get one. I mean, it's, it's not very expensive, um, and it could be converted into this settled status for free. And you don't really have a, a huge amount to lose. Now, if you do get one of those, and you can show that you acquired this status a year ago, or if you're married to a British citizen, you don't have to worry about that one year, then do think about applying for British citizenship. Now, I know that's a really emotional topic, and a lot of people think, why the hell should I apply for citizenship of a country which is treating us like this? And I get that completely. And, and it's also extremely expensive, that bit, because that's not controlled by EU law. So Britain charges huge fees, and there you, it's well over £1,000. So a lot of people can't do that. But if you can, think about it, because for one thing, that guarantees your right to stay. Brexit, no Brexit, you're here. The other thing is, if you become a British citizen, you will get the vote. You will be able to vote in general elections. And you will ha if you live here, a lot of people live here for many years, it's right that you, that you have a say in what happens in this country. And if you become a British citizen, then in most cases, you don't have to give up your existing other EU citizenship. It depends on the country, but most countries allow dual nationality. You will have a say in what happens here. Now, maybe there will be another referendum or a people's poll. There will be general elections, so you will be able to... You'll have a, a voice. So just consider that. Just one last point here, one technical thing. People often ask about children born in the UK. So people move here, they have children here, they wonder about their children's status. It's really complicated, but the basic rule is... If, if you have a child who was born in the UK to you, to an EU citizen, before October 2000, then if you are working here or self-employed or self-sufficient with the comprehensive insurance, that child is British. They're, they're British, that's it. Even if they have grown up now, that child is British and get a British passport. Between October 2000 and April 2006, then in most cases that child is not a British citizen. But if you have since acquired permanent residence, even if you didn't bother getting the card, you can register the child as a British citizen. And children born since the 30th of April 2006, if you did your five years and got your permanent residence before then, even without the document, then, um, then that child, if, if you got your permanent residence, you completed the five years before the child was born, that child is a British citizen. 
And as finally children born in the UK, who spend 10 years in the UK, those children can be registered as British, um, never mind what the status of their parents. So that's just a sort of little snapshot of what the rules are. That's the legal bit about staying. I'm going to just pass on to Andrew now, who's going to talk about the bigger picture here and what's really at stake. Thank you, Kim. I think we all remember where we were um, on the day of the um, Brexit vote. Um, Kingsley Napley had had a party the night before um, overlooking the Thames, and we had a poll. It was full of lawyers and accountants, and we had a poll, and I think it was around 25% of the people at that event voted leave. And I thought, hmm, if 25% of our group voted to leave, it doesn't hold out much hope. And then Sunderland came in, I went to bed, and I woke up at four with David Bim Dimbleby going, Britain has voted leave, and I went to the toilet and I threw up. I physically threw up, I was shocked. And we went back to work, and I've never seen 30 immigration lawyers just silent. We just didn't know what to say. Um, as I said earlier, I come from Norfolk, um, it's a different place to London. This is an echo chamber. All my family voted for Brexit. My mum, my dad, my sister, my auntie, my uncle. And I said to my dad, what will it take for you to even consider that voting leave was a mistake? Interest rates go up to 16%, I lose my house, I lose my job, your pensions fall away. And he said nothing. Because for me, it's not about economics. It's not about the common travel area. It's not about freedom of movement. It's not about the common external tariff. It's about me. It's my gut reaction. And we sometimes forget about that in London, that it's about a core emotion. And what the press have done over the last 10 years is whip up that core emotion. So when Nigel Farage stood in front of that poster of very dark Syrians walking around Europe. That was nothing to do with freedom of movement. That was to do with a feeling of invasion of the other. And as soon as that poster was put up, we had lost the vote. So Kim mentioned the legal. We're all lawyers. I explained my background, what I did in my 20s. And it's about taking back control. And I will deliberately use that phrase. So Brexit means Brexit. What does it mean? Is it soft? Is it hard? Is it scrambled? <laughs> For me, on the 29th of March 2019, this passport that allowed me to live and work in 27 other countries, I will lose my rights. Okay, so for British citizens, a poll, a not even a legal referendum, that had legal status, it was advisory, we had a parliament stripping me as a British citizen of my European citizenship rights. Now, I'm very angry about that, but that anger is tempered by me knowing that I need to do something about it. What do I need to do to protect me, my family, my children? And that means me finding a way to either gain European Union citizenship or grandfathering myself in into an EU state. I've considered moving to Ireland or going to Portugal or Spain. It's very easy to be emotional and saying, I'm doing nothing. I'm doing nothing. Brexit's not going to happen. And part of our job as lawyers is to dispel some of the myths that you hear on Twitter, on Facebook. The default position is Brexit is going to happen, OK? Plan for the worst, and when the worst doesn't happen, that is the benefit. So what should you do? Patricia mentioned that we've done around 10 talks so far. Um, the first French event we did, it was 1,000 French citizens, incredibly angry, half of which had been on the demonstration before. Um, but there is a group of people who are saying, it is not, I'm not worried, nothing's going to happen. I've got a house, nothing's gonna happen, it's fine. I'm married to a British citizen, okay? We spend our days as immigration lawyers 
telling people they cannot live in their country when they're married to a British citizen. 50% of British citizens cannot bring their spouse or civil partner or unmarried partner to the UK, okay? It is not an automatic right, okay? As EU citizens, you have more rights than me to bring partners into the UK. So there's this myth that if you're married to a British citizen, I don't need to do anything. Life will go on, not true. My children are British, again, Having British children does not give you the right to live in this country under British immigration law. The best one we have from our high net worth clients <laughs> is I paid thousands and thousands of pounds in capital gains tax. That's not gonna allow you to stay either. <laughs> Having a British driver's license, <laughs> that's gonna be worthless under Brexit. We're all gonna have to get an international driving permit, so watch that space. And Brexit, it's not going to happen. Well, plan for the fact that it is. What you must do is don't stick your head in the sand and think it will go away, okay? It's not gonna go away, okay? You need to plan. The hostile environment, okay? Theresa May was a former Home Secretary. There have been over 45,000 change, 45, changes in immigration rules. Being an immigration lawyer is quite difficult nowadays. By, by the time we speak about a change in the immigration law, within half an hour it's changed again and our advice has to be revised. And she's presided over seven immigration bills. Now the hostile environment was created to affect those people who don't have an entitlement to be here. Now you would have seen in the press certain Commonwealth citizens who came here when we had freedom of movement through the Commonwealth countries. People who are lawfully allowed to live here because they came here before the 1st of January 1973, who are detained, who are that close to being removed from the UK, who are unlawfully detained. That is the hostile environment. So you may want to do nothing and not apply for settled status. But we are now living in a country where having a document grants you access to your right to rent, to health services, to live on a daily basis. The Home Office won't do anything to you. They won't try to remove you. They won't deport you. They will make your life difficult if you don't get a document certifying that you have a right to live here. So the hostile environment, since the referendum, some former colleagues on um, previous panels have mentioned that more EU nationals have been removed since year end June 2017, and EU citizens are now getting detained more than sixfold since the referendum. The policies that the Home Office would never dream about doing, Brexit has given them the green light to do. Okay, and you need to you need to focus on that. And I mentioned before about Skype families. We have refusal letters that we have to read to our clients and the Home Office say you can have your family life by Skype. You can say hello to your children by Skype. So these are the kind of letters that we deal with on a daily basis. Those are some asylum refusals that we deal with. This is the culture of disbelief within the Home Office. Um, I like number 47. Um, it is noted that visiting gay bars and clubs is not an indication of your sexuality. Well, if I claimed asylum, then I wouldn't qualify as an asylum seeker by visiting a gay bar. Top one is about being Christian. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot. It's considered your answer is vague and lacks detail considering your claim to have read the Bible and attended prayer groups. We deal with this on a daily basis. This is not news to us. So that's the kind of environment that we're in. Unfortunately, you are dealing with this for the first time. It's coming as a shock to you that people are treated like this. Non-EU citizens are treated like this every single day. So what do we do? We take back control. Now, apologies, I didn't do that deliberately, the con bit. So that, that was our marketing department who had to actually change it. So take back control of your life. And how do you do that? Everyone is talking about that the referendum is the final ever vote we are ever going to have. It is a point in history. And people's views change. And whenever you are at a dinner party and you hear that awful phrase, it will be fine, you challenge people. Just like I used to challenge people when I was younger. And so you are talking about me, okay? 
That person that you are talking about is me. And what the AIDS crisis gave to this country was that nice white middle class families for the first time realized that the other was their children. And overnight, politics changed and the narrative changed. And it's about talking. And every time you hear a comment on the bus, at dinner parties when people say, I wasn't voting against you, I was voting against someone else. The benefit scrounger, the other, that has always happened in history. Six million Jews, a million gay men, Srebrenica, Rwanda, there is always the other. And you need to tell people, you are the other, okay? You are talking about me. And that is how you change people's views. So this was the, this was the referendum point um, when we voted. As you can see, my parents' generation, it wasn't this mass anti-EU vote. It was 60%, 40% of over 65-year-olds still voted Remain. A lot of them voted Remain for completely different reasons, and people voted Leave for completely different reasons. And we need to get out there and explain what the EU is about. And what saddens me about the Remain campaign is that there's never been a positive voice about what the EU does for our lives. And those politicians who now come and say, well, you know, we need a new political party. Where were you when it came to Article 50? Where were you? We live in a parliamentary democracy. We don't have rule of law by referendum. We have rule of law by MPs. And you completely and utterly failed to stand up as your role as MPs. So that was the vote. It was very close. And my role here, and Patricia as well, is to try and persuade you to take back control. And where you can, where you can afford it, is to take back control and become British. And for some of you, it is an incredibly emotional journey. But what other country doesn't give the right of three million people to decide their future? This is your future, and people are deciding it for you. And you need to think about, are you prepared to do that again? There will be a second referendum. There will be another general election. Do you want to be voiceless again? OK? I'm just going to put it out there. That's all I'm going to say. Just think about it. So your voice. We've had the anniversary of the suffragettes. They went to prison. They demonstrated. They were force-fed. In history, people have always demonstrated for their rights. And as a three million group of people, your turn is now. But for some of you, it's too emotional. The damage has been done. You want to leave. And I understand that. There are times when this is not the country that I want to live in. I have residency in New Zealand. New Zealand's a lot sunnier. It's nicer. It's a lot more liberal. But it's 24 hours away on the plane. And I will give up some of the things that I live for in the UK. But if you do make that decision, you need to make that decision in the knowledge that things will change when you leave. And if you do decide to leave, make sure that you have a safety net and you have done everything you possibly can to protect you. And for some of you, you may not want to protect your status, but protect your children's status. Because they're not the ones who can decide in five, ten years' time to come back to Britain to study at university. And things will change in the rest of Europe as well. And you may go to France, to Germany, to Italy, and then things don't work out. Culturally, you don't like it. I've had people today come up to me and say, I'm going back to France and Switzerland. I don't even want to go back, but I don't want to be here. That's fine. <laughs> go check it out. But at least make sure that you've got an insurance policy. So I'm going to give you some examples. Jean-Francois, his wife Julie, three children, Maxine, Christine, and Chazenay. Obviously Chazenay, she's born here a lot later, a lot of X Factor. They came to the UK in 1999. JF worked until 2012. And this is one of the myths. Oh, he stopped working. He hasn't got five years. Free movement directive. It's five years even before the 30th of April, 2006. So Jean-Francois and his wife acquired permanent residence 
on the 30th of April, 2006. Jean-Francois is taking time out. Maxine was born on the 1st of July, 2000. So as Kim mentioned earlier, Maxine is British. C was born on the 2nd of March, 2003, so has an entitlement to register. And Chazenay was born on the 30th of June, 2016, so is British by birth. So that's basically what I've just said. What can you do now? You have made that decision to leave. How much is it going to cost you to have that insurance policy? Two PR documents, £130. Naturalisation, 2,564. Apologies for the um, formatting. Child passports, 138. Adult passports, 145. Child registration, 973. A grand total of 3,950. Now, you may think and that's an incredible amount of money. For some people, it is. But that is citizenship for all of you as a family and the right to come back to the UK at any point and for your children born abroad, so your children's children born abroad, also to be British. And we see so many individuals come to us and say, my grandmother was born in Italy in 1853, if only, if only they had done something. And you've got to think about the future, that this is not about just your future, it's about your children, your grandchildren. Give them something that they can also rely on. No one can predict the future. Mrs. Thatcher was a principal proponent of the single market. So there will be at some point a second referendum or a general election. And if you are British, you will have that say. And given that it was so close, if we make as many people as we can British, the result will be different. So if you do nothing, and there are people I've spoken to today say, I'm doing nothing, I don't want settled status, I've had enough, I'm going, that's fine. But think about an alternative reality where you decide to do nothing. Kim mentioned that the transitional agreement is going to the end of December 2020. The Home Office have said that there will be also an overhang period where literally people will be allowed to apply for their, to document their rights. But this is 2025. Things have changed, people have moved on. There may be a new immigration system, okay? We cannot guarantee that EU citizens will have any preferential rights whatsoever. You may be treated as third country citizens. <coughs> the general data protection regulation, the right to be forgotten. At some point, you are going to need to document that your children are British and show that you were exercising treaty rights 10 years before. Now, the GDPR is the right to be forgotten. That is organizations deleting data that they no longer need. Some of you may have problems getting that evidence that you had acquired PR and your children were British. Delays. We are talking about 3 million people registering at some future time. You may want to come back to the UK. There may be hideous delays with getting British passports. And also the cost. And what I'm going to show you now is the cost if you're a non-EU citizen. And these are the prices today, not the prices in 2025. This is an application in France for three people. A tier two visa, that's an employer visa where they have to have a sponsor license. You have to go through a resident labor market test and prove that there are no settled workers to do the job. £1,761. If you want it processed in 24 hours, it's £2,888. Of course, you pay the immigration health surcharge, which is going up from £200 a year to £400 a year. After three years, you have to apply again. That's £3,801. The Conservative Party have said that the immigration health surcharge will be £600 a year. So that's £3,600. And for ILR, the equivalent of PR for £65, it's £8,661. You're not even British yet, and that's 22,511. That is what an Australian, an American pays today. And those fees are going up on the 6th of April. So even if you don't want to think about the future, think about the cost that at some point in the scenario where EU citizens are third country citizens, the cost is going to be horrendous. So I'm now going to pass you over to Stacey, who is going to talk about the lovely sub subject of family breakups and what you should do now if you are going through traumatic periods of relationship breakups.
Um, yes, now for something completely different. Um, you've heard a lot about immigration issues um, in light of Brexit. I'm here to talk about family law issues. Um, quite frankly, those family law issues would apply to an international family with or without Brexit. But Brexit really puts the spotlight on those issues for our, um, our multinational families. And quite frankly, Brexit, sadly, is a factor that may result in marital uh, issues. Um, it's hugely divisive. Um, so uh, the, the message is these issues aren't new because of Brexit, but sadly there's another layer of complexity um, for our European families. Um, if I hear the phrase Brexit means Brexit one more time, I'm going to punch somebody um, because I don't... I don't know what Brexit means, um, and it's a stupid phrase, and the people that say it don't know what Brexit means. Um, what it doesn't mean, though, is a, a fall in the number of um, multinational families living here in the UK. There's some stats on the screen for you. Um, the number of live births in England and Wales to non-UK mothers is actually going up. Um, and of the 10 most common countries where children are born to non-UK mothers and fathers, four of them are member states. Um, we have three million um, EU citizens living in, in the UK and they're all members of families. Um, and sadly, some of them may be having family law issues which, which require advice. Um, so I'm going to try and highlight some of the issues that... Um, that families should be thinking about um, to the extent that they need family law advice um, before moving on at a canter, because I'm aware we're short on time, um, to the extra complexities that Brexit is going to pose. Um, so to help me highlight some of those issues, I'm, I'm going to revisit Jean-Francois and Julie. Um, Sadly, the uh, toll of Brexit opinions and other factors um, have resulted in Jean-Francois and Julie deciding to go their separate ways. Uh, Julie intends to issue divorce proceedings. She also wishes to return to France with the children. Um, Jean-Francois can't return. His, his work is here. He's got relatives here. Um, it's just too difficult for him. Um, the trip from London to Paris isn't actually a difficult one. So with a heavy heart, he's amenable to Julie moving with the children, providing there's agreement beforehand as to how he can see the children and how he can continue their relationship. Um, the... First question for Jean-François and Julie, um, and they will probably have different answers, is which country should deal with their divorce? Is there a choice of country? And if there is a choice of country, which country would they like, would they prefer to, to deal with the divorce and the ancillary issues that arise from it? France and England, in our example, are both currently signatories of Brussels too. Um, they are signatories by virtue of being a member state, um, which obviously has consequences for England from next March. Um, but as things stand under Brussels too, um, as Jean-Francois and Julie are both French nationals, France could deal with the divorce. Um, their centre of interest is also here. Um, they've lived here for 19 years. They work here. The children go to school here. Their service providers, doctors, opticians, etc., are all here. Um, it's fair to say their centre of interest is here, which leads to their habitual residence. Because their habitual residence is here, England could also deal with the divorce and the an an ancillary issues. Um, so we have England versus France. Um, as to who should deal with the divorce, we currently have a first-past-this-post system. We call them Eurostar divorces. Um, it's the one point that I actually hope Brexit improves um, because with one state being far more beneficial to one party in the divorce, we often have a race to court. Somebody will rush off to court to try and seize and secure the uh, laws of the member state that will be more beneficial to them. Um, let's assume in our example that... Uh, Jean-Francois is financially far better off than Julie. 
England is known as the divorce capital of the world. Um, we have that title for a reason. We are notoriously generous to the financially weaker party here. We have a really wide discretion. So Julie may prefer to secure uh, the English divorce system. Uh, Jean-Francois will not. Um, if England is seized tomorrow and Jean-Francois issues his French petition on Wednesday, currently... France will very politely say, I'm very sorry, Jean-Francois, England were first in time. We have to pause what we're doing here while England cracks on with the divorce, providing England does properly have jurisdiction. Turning to relocating with the children, um, it doesn't happen in every divorce, but with many divorces, um, particularly where there are international families, um, after the dust has settled and after the divorce, one party may wish to leave the country. Um, I was born to an Irish father and an English mother in uh, Wexford and I lived in Ballygallin. You may detect the hint of an English accent. Um, following my parents' divorce, my mum moved back to England and that's where I've grown up since I was four years old. Um, Jean-Francois, in our example, is, is willing to let Julie and the children go, um, but sensibly wants to have the arrangements agreed beforehand. Um, at the moment, the, as things stand, the children's habitual residence would be in England. So if there was a disagreement between Jean-Francois and Julie, the English courts would deal with it. They don't need to go to court, providing Jean-Francois agrees. Julie cannot take the children without his agreement or a court order. If she does that, she is committing abduction, which is a very serious offence. Um, but they are op they are, they're open to agree that between them. Um, Jean-Francois would be very well advised, even if there are no court proceedings, to have that agreement recorded in a court order, particularly if he's worried, which sadly does sometimes happen, um, that Julie is just saying she agrees just to get his consent to leave with the children and once she goes, she's going to change her mind and be difficult and his relationship with the children might suffer. If he has the arrangements recorded in a court order, as things stand, uh, we have uh, that would be recognised and enforced in France. Now, post-Brexit, where will they be left? Um, England versus France, I don't know what will happen. Um, Post-Brexit, we may say to France, hey, we were first in time. And France may say, I don't care, you voted to leave. Um, we could end up with two sets of divorce proceedings, one in England, one in France. We just don't know. Um, we also don't know if the recognition and enforceability of orders will continue. Um, so given that we are getting ever closer to, to D-Day next March, uh, Jean-Francois would be well advised to take local French advice and have a French order drawn up as well. Uh, we call them mirror orders. So if he gets to France trying to enforce an English order and they say, sorry, mate, we, we, that's not relevant here, he's got a French order to fall back on and he can enforce that instead. Um, hopefully, obviously, that won't happen and hopefully Jean-Francois and Julie will manage the breakdown of the relationship in an amicable fashion for the sake of the children. We now turn to Maxine, our eldest child in this family. We're going to skip ahead to summer of this year. Maxine's now 18. She's in love. She's moved back to France to complete her university studies and her French boyfriend, Guy, has proposed to her. And they intend to be married next January in Lyon. Um, our young, loved-up couple are doing fairly well for themselves. Guy has uh, about two, mil two million euros in assets. Um, but he's got liabilities of 600,000 euros. He's, he's, a, you know, he's got a lot of drive and ambition. He's doing well for himself. He's got a decent salary, a good income. Um, but he generates that income by investing in quite risky business projects. Um, high risk, high gain. Jean-Francois and Julie have worked very, very hard for their three children. And Maxine has savings of half a million euros already. She also has an interest in a UK-based property portfolio with her siblings and has good future inheritance prospects. They don't know what they're going to do when they get married. They feel like Maxine will probably finish her studies in the UK and then they might, sorry, in, in France, and then they might move back to the UK. Depending on 
where they end up living. Hopefully things will go very well for our young couple in love, but if they don't, um, there could be very different consequences for the finances in the event that there is a divorce. Um, France has the concept of marriage contracts and property regimes. And in this case, there's a good reason for uh, Maxine and Guy to enter into one. Um, the default regime in, Pran in France is community of property. Um, essentially, each party retains the assets they acquired prior to the marriage and that they inherited. But anything acquired after the marriage is considered joint and equal. Um, for a couple who are married in England and Wales who own pro property in France, they would automatically fall under a different regime, uh, the separation of assets regime, uh, which essentially means that on a divorce, each spouse would leave the marriage with their own assets. Um, in this scenario, there's a good reason for Maxine and Guy to consider the separation of assets regime. Um, the property regimes um, and the marriage contracts are binding on third parties, for example, creditors. We know that Guy has high risk investments. The risk of bankruptcy is a real risk for him. Um, electing the separation of assets regime would essentially protect Maxine in the event of Guy's bankruptcy, her assets would stay safe. Um, but if they do move to England and they want to have a say in their finances in the event that the worst happens and their marriage comes to an end. Will the marriage contract do or will they need something more? Um, we don't have marriage contracts here, they don't exist. Um, and many people wrongly think that we're behind the drag curve with Europe on prenuptial agreements because they think marriage contracts are prenuptial agreements and they are wrong. Um, marriage contracts are usually two or three pieces of paper. Our prenups are about 30 pages long. My trainee hates drafting them. I'm not a big fan either. <laughs> they are very, very lengthy. Um, Nothing in statute here automatically recognises the enforceability of nuptial agreements. But since a 2010 case, um, the English courts are giving effect to them, providing that they're freely entered into by each party. They go into them eyes wide open and in the circumstances they're fair. Um, in Guy and Julie's case, sorry, Guy and Maxine's case, um, the English court would look behind the French marriage contract. Why did they enter into it? Did they have legal advice? Was there disclosure? Does it meet need, meets needs of the, the couple and the children? If the answer to those questions are no, it's not going to be sufficient. Um, so they'd be well advised to enter into a nuptial agreement too. Um, that gives them the opportunity to choose jurisdiction and a choice of law. However, they can't oust the English court's jurisdiction. We're a bit arrogant here. We can import foreign law. So we won't import foreign law, but we can export our law. So many other EU member states will recognise our maintenance provisions in a UK agreement, but we won't recognise theirs. Um, what does Brexit mean for this? Um, again, we don't know. We don't know if after next March, other EU member states will recognise our maintenance provisions in a UK agreement. So Guy and Maxine would again be well advised to include a Brexit clause in the agreement, um, saying that um, when we leave the union, um, they will agree to review the prenup. Um, moving to my last point. Changes post-Brexit, for better or for worse. Um, You'd be forgiven for thinking that I'm a family lawyer here just talking about divorcing couples and who gets the house and is that really important. Um, but family law goes further than that. Um, we are all members of family. Um, the family law structure in England is so European. Over the last 20 years or so, we've developed um, a framework of rules and regulations to allow uniformity in terms of procedure across the EU. Um, it doesn't just end at divorce and money, it's children issues, abduction, the speed at which the left behind parent can spring into action, um, sharing of information between different organisations. These are all really, really important points. Um, the withdrawal bill um, proposal to family law was quite frankly bloody useless. Um, it suggests that we're going to implement um, EU law and domestic legislation, but completely ignores that the other member states might not do the same. Um, so we might lose uh, the reciprocal arrangement. That has effects for recognition, for enforcement. Um, 
we're not sure what's going to happen with the Court of Justice of the U European Union. Um, if we lose that appellate structure, um, then we could be in difficulty resolving disputes where one member state doesn't agree with us. Um, all is not lost. I'm a member of Resolution. It's about, it's over 6,000 lawyers strong, family lawyers in the UK. Um, resolutions at the heart of um, lobbying parliament to make sure they quite frankly get their act into gear for our family law clients um, because we want to make sure that they don't fall through the gaps. Um, they are now tabling amendments to the withdrawal bill, which would include reporting every six months on their progress in negotiating a reciprocal arrangement with our EU counterparts, um, suggesting that referrals to the CJEU can be made for the next eight years and that we will have regard to those decisions, and importantly, ensuring that the Hague Convention is ratified. Um, we're just at the start of this um, process. There's much to go. Um, but whilst there is uncertainty at the moment, um, I do hope I can assure you all that many family lawyers really are pushing to make sure um, that you don't fall between the family law gaps post next March.